You are now entering the Honeysuckle Podcast. Hello, welcome to another edition of great content in the financing of the plant wellness, natural wellness space, uh, brought to you by Honeysuckle Magazine and content. Uh, My name is Matt Nordgren, founder and CEO of Arcadian Capital and Arcadian Fund. Uh, This is a very exciting moment for me uh, because today I get to spend some time talking to a dear friend um, for many, many, many years, dating back to our college years uh, in Texas, uh, that I know we're both excited about uh, seeing that market continue to open up its mind in terms of its acceptance with natural wellness. And um, the individual that I'm speaking about is none other than Ricky Williams. And uh, Ricky's joining us today um, specifically because uh, this issue of, uh, of what we're focused on uh, is uh, in and around uh, Black History Month in February. And it's a time where Uh, we all get to, uh, in cannabis and in hemp, uh, really think about the years of persecution that many uh, minority communities um, have experienced in terms of uh, being uh, adversely affected uh, with the war on drugs and and many things that have happened over many years. And uh, I I use the word drugs only because that's what they say. We don't consider this a drug. Uh, But there's there's a lot of reasons why February is a very important month for this country and our world, but specifically in our industry. Uh, this is a month we're really excited about. And um, lastly, it's the Super Bowl month. And so uh, we can't um, you know, forget the fact that our guest today is uh, one of the NFL's most prolific rushers, uh, certainly maybe one of college's greatest ever to strap him up uh, in, in Ricky Williams. And so, Ricky, we're so glad to have you here today, friend. And um, love to just uh, turn the table to you and, and, and let you introduce yourself and, um, and kind of touch on some of those topics we just mentioned in our introduction. Yeah, I mean, it's like the, it's the trifecta, huh? Three birds with one stone. I'm black, <laughs> I played football, and I smoke a lot of weed. So, so, so yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, just a little social commentary. You know, it's interesting that we get, we get, we get one month. So let's, let's make the most of it. Um, and, but I think the deeper conversation is really about uh, diversity, you know, and, and to me, the value of diversity isn't a, isn't a quota or a box you check. It's really about uh, having a holistic view. Holistic view means you're taking the whole. In order to take the whole, you have to listen to all of the voices. Uh, and I think in our country in general, I think the minority voice has been disproportionately um, not heard. And so thank you. F- Thank you for this opportunity to share my uh, diverse perspectives because a uh, warning to everyone, they are diverse and probably shocking. So let's do this. <laughs> well, they're, they're honest and that's um, something you've always been and stood for. And um, I guess the first question uh, has to be, you know, based on your NFL career and uh, even your college career in terms of uh, your choice to consent, continue to use plant medicine uh, for various reasons. And I think at that time, all of us uh, didn't have the understanding of what this medicine or these types of medicines really did. Uh, but in fact, I think not a lot of people know your deep understanding of these medicines and the path you went on uh, to learn about them. But uh, I guess the first question then is, um, what convinced you to make cannabis and, and different types of plant medicines part of your health tools during your NFL career? And, and what led you to continue to make that decision back at a time when it wasn't as well known as it is today? I think it was the evolution of, of my definition of what health, health means. You know, health means wholeness. But growing up and playing football, wholeness meant 100 yards. <laughs> 100 yards a game, at least four and a half a carry, you know, in scoring touchdowns, you know, at least every other game. Um, and I, I was doing a really good job of that kind of health and wholeness. But my personal life and my life off the field uh, was like was crap. And so my inner life. And so, you know, we call it mental health now. We have we have a term for it. And so I started to turn my attention to my mental health and I prioritized that. And I found the best thing for my mental health 
uh, was cannabis. Yeah, and uh, so many are starting to understand that today. And, you know, um, having also played at the University of Texas where, where you played and then, um, you know, being a part of seeing your journey, uh, I guess the question is in terms of digging in a little bit deeper there, what has cannabis done for you specifically uh, or parts of the hemp plant that nothing else did for you during that time? Well, it was, it was, um, I'm using this terminology to make fun of it, that it was a gateway drug, you know, but it was a gateway drug to myself. And, and it's funny, I, I've been, I've been hearing the conversations about cannabis and mental health, you know, that they're starting to, to gain, to gain some momentum. And so I started to ask myself, like, I hear it, but I felt like it's a buzzword. So I really reflected and I said, what is, what is mental health, right? What is mental health? And I think, okay, mental, mental means it's inside. All right. So it's the health of our internal, our internal environment. Okay. And I think as guys, and at least me as a football player, my training was in order to be able to execute, I needed to turn off. I needed to turn off the stuff. <laughs> right. And I realized that I, I became more alienated from myself. And I started to notice, you know, I didn't, I didn't do it for this reason, but I started to notice when I consumed cannabis, I started to become more aware of what was going on in there. I started to have some perspective. And I, you know, at the time that the language that I used was, I said, it's like self psychotherapy. Mm. Right. And that's really, and I didn't know if I was using the terminology correctly, but that's exactly what it was. Mm. Right. I was having those inner conversations with myself and revealing and becoming more aware of some of my motivations that I wasn't privy to. Mm. And it was like enlightening. Right. And part of my journey after, after starting to have these reflections is I realized playing football isn't really what I'm supposed to be doing. And so I, I retired from the NFL and I started to travel and I gravitated towards spirituality, uh, Ayurveda, holistic healing, herbalism, meditation, yoga. And I started to learn to meditate. And as I started to learn to meditate, I noticed, huh, this feeling that they call meditation, this feels almost exactly like those self psychotherapy <laughs> sessions I was, I was having. Okay. And then I started reading more and I saw that the, the god in India of meditation, Shiva, that his, his devotees consumed cannabis. And I was like, ah, oh, I started to connect the dots, I started to connect the dots. And I started to realize that part of our mental health is that we have to be spiritually healthy. We have to have some feel like we have some connection to the world around us, but we don't connect to the world around us so much through our external behavior. It's more of this internal feel where we feel like our internal urges are something that fit in our environment. We don't feel like our internal urges are always getting us in trouble in our environment. And so my mom, <laughs> she wanted one of her favorite sayings. She says, go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. <laughs> and I realized that outwardly I was celebrated for what I was doing, but every time I showed who I was on the inside, I was suspended or scolded, or there was a nasty article about that. And so, you know, it, it, it helped me become more healthy on the inside. And because of that, I started to gravitate and move towards environments where I could thrive and I could be myself more. And I became more, I started to become more whole. Yep. Well said, friend. Um, you know, I, I think it, I have a question for you. I want to dig a little bit deeper into uh, the, your divergent healing interests, because uh, I think that's one of the greatest things you bring to this space is decades of uh, deep research. I mean, your journey is over to India and other parts of the world where you really got to explore this medicine. I, I want to talk a little bit about that, but you just brought up a really interesting point, which is how you were treated uh, during your time as an athlete. And, you know, I want to move away from that period of time and get into what you're doing now. But I think that sort of line of thinking brings up a question that particularly when we're talking about Black History Month and uh, minority, uh, you know, interest during this month in, in, as a broader uh, category. Um, and, and this might be a controversial question, but I just want to get your thoughts on it. Based on the way you presented yourself then, um, it, you know, as a black athlete uh, who used cannabis and had dreadlocks, do you feel like during that time, if you just use cannabis and use these medicines, would you have perhaps been treated differently if you were a white football player that perhaps, you know, did not have dreadlocks? Did that play into some of the uh, criticisms you had for being yourself 
and ultimately with regards to suspensions and other things you uh, experienced during your career, w would that have made a difference then? And then compare that to today's environment. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, so I, I want to answer this question honestly, and I'm going to tiptoe a little bit, but, but it's a, it's a really, really good question that, that, that needs an answer. Okay. So first of all, um, and I'm not doing this to be divisive. I'm doing this to be honest is because our eyes are our most powerful and trustworthy sense. Okay. That whatever we see, it, right, it activates certain free associations and connections in our mind. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is race plays into everything because, you know, we see a perfect stranger. We don't know anything about them. And so we look, okay, they're a guy or a, a female or they're white. Or, wait, we start to try to guess and try to figure it out based on our past experiences. That's just the way our brains work. So race plays into everything. Okay. And, and I think the sad part is that if you're, if you're an outlier or you're different, right, you, you get, you're, you're a victim of stereotypes. And so the, the details of, I think, how it, how it affected me personally was when I, when I got into the NFL's drug program, okay? This was back in 2002. Uh, I was traded to the Dolphins. And when I was in New Orleans, we were drug tested in training camp. And so everyone knew before training camp, you just stopped smoking. So, and I was new to smoking, so I didn't really, I, I didn't really get it yet. And I get traded to Miami and they test in the off season and no one told me. So I come to work and they're like, drug test and i was like oh i just smoked last night so i failed a drug test and they put me into the program and when they put you in the drug program they send you to some town where you spend a whole day talking to psychiatrists and they put you through all these tests and then they put you in a two-year drug program where you're tested nine times a month and then you have to go talk to a, a therapist once once a week and so when I, you know i'm a i'm an optimistic person and so when this happened i was like you know, it's not going to hurt to be able to talk to someone. It's not a big deal. And, you know, I can tolerate I can tolerate pissing in a cup, whatever. No big deal. So uh, I started in the program and the whole program. The aim is to say, you know, I know it's <laughs> they really there's like the whole thing. It's hard to be black. It's hard to be black, but you can't let the stress of being black make you ruin this great opportunity. OK, that was the message. Right. That, that was just the assumption of what the issue was. And that almost that pissed me off even more, you know, because I was like, they're not, the, if you're trying to help me, like at least see who I am and realize. Right. And so that isn't so that doesn't go. Well. I fell a couple more drug tests. And at the very end, when I'm talking to the doctor, you know, the doctor said to me, you know, said the biggest mistake we made with you is we just assumed you were a certain kind of person. We didn't re we didn't really take the time to realize you were just a seeker and a spiritual person, you know, so we treated you like a certain way. And so I, I think that's the biggest issue with race is that we, we don't see who's really there. And I, and I think that's the biggest travesty because we miss opportunities to grow and to learn. And we be little people because we don't acknowledge and appreciate what their gifts and talents are. Right. In terms of creating a safe space for someone to be exactly who they are so we can understand and then hope to provide balance to people because life is about balance. And um, if you can't create a safe space for somebody, how can you possibly balance them uh, to achieve the highest level possible? It's the opposite. It's the opposite. You, you, right. you trigger their wounds and you send them you know, more into that place. Right. And you define it in a way that they don't define it and you compartmentalize and limit somebody's ability to to find growth and so um do you feel like uh that we're in a different time now 20 years later is, is this a different time when we go into black history month in terms of how athletes are perceived and the platform they have do you, do you think things have changed and are you happy with it i think things have changed culturally and i think we see the the effects in sports and i think the fact that, you know, back in 2004, you know, I was shamed for, for my cannabis use. And now when there's a, a sports cannabis story, you know, CNN calls me first to come, to come speak, to come speak about it. So <laughs> I, I think just because our, you know, we're starting to loosen up and, and open up. And I think a lot of it has to do with, with the cannabis industry. And I, and I think, you know, even if the, the initial uh, thrust was, was financial, Right. As people started to push this and had and started to consume cannabis and see what it was really about. The con and the research started to come. The conversation started to change. And now we can talk about wellness and people are not laughing. They're not laughing at us when we when we say it. 
And, and, you know, one of my missions is to, is to take the convert, to keep taking the conversation a little bit further. And, and that's really the passion behind launching Heisman is to have this conversation to say wellness. But, but for me as a, as a professional athlete, wellness was all always directly tied to, to being, uh, to being a better football player. So wellness was always tied to accomplishment, achievement, you know, performance enhancement. And I don't mean like the illegal kind. I mean, how can I get the, how can I get the most out of my potential? How can I get the most out of my potential? And what I realized is those self psychotherapy sessions, reflecting and letting go of stuff and then being able to envision a brighter future. Ah, that was one of my greatest, that was one of my greatest gifts because we see so many people with so much ability and so much talent, but they can't get out of their own way. They can't let go of the, the old stuff and give themselves permission to envision a better future. Amen to that, man. And, and so going back to um, your journey, uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about um, as we work towards uh, talking about your current business, which at Arcadian Capital, we're so thankful to be involved with Heisman and everything you stand for. But one of the reasons we got excited about it, and I think people would love to hear uh, part of your journey, is your divergent healing interest that led you here in terms of cannabis, of course, and hemp, but astrology, Ayurveda, yoga, all sorts of various therapies you've explored. Um, you know, putting that together with your physical, mental, and spiritual health, can you, can you tell us a little bit about the journey in those areas that, that really got you to the point you are today with the business? Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, the that's a great word is, is journey because it, it has been a journey. And I, I think that's one of the things I had to learn in life. When you have early success, you know, you, you tend to think, oh, this is it. But the truth is it takes life experiences to garner wisdom. And so our greatest potential for success is always in time, always in time, you know, and thank God I was able to add other interests than just football, because if all I could talk about right now was football, hell yeah, I'd be a hell of a coach. But <laughs> but, but beyond that, I, I don't think I'd be able to, to help people. And I think my life would feel empty. Yeah. And so when I when I walked away from the NFL, it's a funny story. I uh, started traveling and I found this beautiful plot of land in Australia. And I and I told myself, you know, I could just see myself it's like 85 acres up this beautiful hill, like 180 degree view of the ocean. I said, I just want to live here and, and grow fruits, vegetables, and just, you know, live this life. Okay. And so I, I went into town and I said, I found this plot of land. I want to buy it. And the real estate agent says, you know, in order to buy that plot of land, you have to become a citizen. So I was like, where, where do I sign up? <laughs> so I got I got the paperwork and I started going filling out the paperwork and I got to a section and the section asked basically what are you going to do when you when you come to this country right you got to have some kind of skill you don't can't just come here so I started going down the list looking at all the different skills and there's like 150 different things on that list and I got to the bottom and I realized I don't have a skill like I I, I can play football but other than that like I like <laughs> I can't do anything. And I like, it was, it was a profound moment for me where I realized now that I'm like here, it's not about just sitting on this, this plot of land and, you know, letting my life waste away. I like, I want to do like offer something. Yeah. And so then I had this moment where I reflected and I said, well, what do I want to do? You know, I've been a football player my whole life. And now that I'm not like, and I actually want to realize I want to do something. What do I want to do? So I started reflecting on my life and thinking about what moments gave me the greatest pleasure. Uh, and they were always making someone else feel better, sharing a different perspective, you know, or, or even rubbing someone's back, just making other people feel better. And so I said, you know, I want to I want to do I want to learn how to do healing stuff. I want to learn a skill mm -hmm. where I can be better at helping people feel better. And so when I got back to the States, um, you know, in traveling, I, I came across Ayurveda and something about the philosophy really spoke to me. And so I looked online and there's a, a class a school in Northern California in Grass Valley. It's a crazy story in Grass uh, Valley where I could study Ayurveda. So I moved up to Grass Valley and I started studying Ayurveda. I didn't know that, you know, Northern California was the Mecca of legal medical cannabis at the time, but I landed right in the middle of it. And so uh, I was learning about Ayurvedic herbs, which cannabis is an Ayurvedic herb. And I was learning about cannabis. And so I started playing with the, the different formulas and, and creating stuff. You know, I was, I was learning how to how to help people feel better using herbs and you know, how ironic, you know, my story of, of how an herb helped me feel better. Mm -hmm. And so from from there, my interest ex expanded into body work, 
you know, and it started because my body was beat up from playing football and I was always going to body workers. And I met this guy when I was playing in Canada who said, you know, you might be pretty good at this stuff. You should check it out. So I took a class. I remember the first day in class, I was nervous because this big football player and with all these like middle aged white ladies who were like <laughs> yoga people. And I was like a fish out of water, you know, and, and it's a, it was a hands on class. And so there was a point where we had to put our hands on someone's head and like feel their energy. OK, and I'm like, you know, I'm looking around like, what am I doing? <laughs> but, but as soon as I did it and I really, truly felt th this person's energy, I felt my heart just open and I felt this kind of peace that I never felt before. And I had this feeling of this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I just knew it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm an avid, passionate learner. And so mm -hmm. I just, you know, in the off season, any off week, I, I was taking a class. I was I was preparing myself. I was learning all these skills. And so I've I've collected a bunch of different healing modalities. And and as a, you know, kind of a, a broad thinker and someone that likes to integrate different things, I've been able to take all of these different modalities and philosophies and really really they're all saying the same thing mm -hmm. but take them and, and kind of come up and, and now i do my own thing uh and and part of it is astrology part of it is body work part of it is yoga part of it is meditation uh and a lot of it is cannabis yeah R really a, a holistic approach as you said earlier and um you know i i think more and more people are starting to subscribe to this and um uh, you know, you talk a lot about um, spirituality and as a greater term, uh, we know that many people have different forms of spirituality. I think coming from Texas and being in the South, uh, you know, I, I know you were raised in the Baptist church, for example, and uh, which traditionally, um, you know, warns people away from alternative healing methods. And so do most forms of t traditional organized uh, religion. And, uh, and, and particularly in, in minority culture and black culture, um, how did you find the courage to investigate uh, these modalities of holistic healing through astrology and other ways? And how would you encourage other people of color to fight these stigmas um, from a spiritual sense, uh, you know, given some of the history? Well, uh, I think it, it all comes down to, to education. And, and I mean that in a couple of different ways. I mean, first realize that we've been educated. Okay. And, and so <laughs> the, the education we received has holes in it, you know, and just right. And I mean, our moral education, right. Our, our scholastic education, right. It, there was some, a lot of it was helpful, but there's holes. And I think as we become adults are that we have to redefine what education means to filling in those holes. Uh, and I think, you know, once you you're honest with yourself and realize that there are some I don't know everything. Right. My parents didn't know everything. <laughs> My parents weren't right about everything. OK, <laughs> the preacher wasn't right about everything. OK. Right. Even the good ones. OK. Right. I think once we, we realized that, then the, to me, the natural curiosity took over and I became passionate about filling in those holes. And so when I recognized the hole. You know, I'd, I'd seek out information to, to try to fill it. And, and it, amazing, just the just the intent, for, you know, like I was studying Ayurveda and not even thinking about cannabis, really, not at all. I was really like, even some way, like I'm moving away, right? I'm moving away from this horrible thing. I'm moving towards like the good, the good herbs, right? And so I, I, that, that's what I really what I was thinking. And then I opened this Ayurvedic book and there's a whole chapter on cannabis. And I'm sitting there scratching my head like, uh, this isn't supposed to happen. And then I read the chapter and I'm like, oh my God, this has been medicine for a long, for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, in those moments of like, of revelation where you realize I knew, I knew I was onto something. Okay. That makes it worth it. Yeah. That, that's what gave me the courage, to, you know, because all of the, because especially me, someone ahead of my time, all these things I knew I was onto and people told me I was crazy. I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Well, you, you, you know, I think um, uh, just the, the fact that you use this word encouragement, um, you know, for yourself is something I think people are going to take away and have taken away from your story. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, that you, your point of talking about the education aspect is encouragement itself, because um, as you say, with experience comes wisdom. They say 10,000 hours to be an expert in anything. That's because you need to have a certain amount of information to do ultimately arrive at a conclusion for yourself and you know frankly um, this is the evolution of being a human being right when you're born 
uh, you have up to 10 times more neural connectivity than you do as an adult because you're born to have experiences and thoughts that shape uh, the way you see the world and respond to it. And so in many ways, I think what you're saying is be encouraged that it, new information can then reshape your brain at any age and you can reverse engineer lines of thinking, right? That's the, that's the, only, that's the only way to do it, right? It's the only way. So, you know, I want to get a little spiritual and technical at the same time okay and the reason i can do this is because of i've taken all these classes okay so, <laughs> <laughs> so so you know in these classes right when when i went through my yoga teachers training right it's they 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 take these like woo woo terms like soul and spirit right and there there's actually a science to it yogic science okay mm -hmm. yogic science and and this is what they say they say the soul Right. Their definition of the soul is the combination of all of our past experiences. Mm. Right. Right. So when we say, you know, someone says something to us that hurts our feelings and we say that hurt my feelings. What we're saying is based on the all of my past experiences that didn't feel good. Mm. OK, so whether it's cannabis, whether it's meditation, what we do when we meditate is we, we still our mind and we start to see these stories play out and mm. we get a little bit of space from them so we can say. OK, I can see based on my experiences in the past that should have hurt my feelings, but uh, I could be a bigger person. I can respond in a different way that feels better to me. And so we were able to. Right. So we, we have to have these learning experiences to have new data so that we can change. We can change the past. Right. So that educate. I mean, it is life is education. It's this this constant growth and developmental process of adding new information that allows us to modify the past to see a brighter future. Amen to that, man. And you think about that in terms of the past, the present, and the future. And, and, and the past is just information to make a decision in the present, the present being the only place you actually have free will and the ability to choose and download new information. And access to new information, exactly. Yeah, and access to new information. So live in the present, use your past to make decisions in the present, right? And the, the future is either faith or fear. I mean, it's not real. Well, well it's, it's like this, though, because some of the experiences in the past, right? Use the information because some of the experiences in the past where we thought we were getting it right, if we really look honestly, we realized we were, we were, you know, we were, we were eating the cheese, right? We, we were, <laughs> we were, we were, we were stuck in a blind spot in the learning of, okay, last time, last time that I felt justified in being upset, right? Right. <laughs> I went too far and it didn't work so well. Maybe this time, Maybe I should look at myself at first instead of yeah. pointing the finger. Right? right. And then we look at ourselves and we realize, oh, when I look at myself and I change my perspective, I'm not upset anymore. Wow. Right. Right. <laughs> right? This education. Right. But, right. but we, we have to be aware of the past and be aware of when the past doesn't feel good. This is the other thing about cannabis. OK, I'm just going to a little bit is that it's like this taboo against feeling good. Mm. You know, mm. there's this taboo against feeling good. And for me, like you can't do anything. Mm. You can't do anything, make any progress until you get to the place of feeling good. Right. Right. Because even if you feel bad and you make progress, it always has this negative association to it. Mm. Right. I remember like this is before you got to Texas, Coach McAvick. Right. One one year he just he got on this like this. He went on this tear about he's going to he's going to get us to to get in the best shape of our lives. Okay. And his his motto was, I'm going to make it fun to run. OK, huh. <laughs> <laughs> OK, it didn't work. But but <laughs> but but the but the idea, though, right, is if, if we could make the even difficult things, if we could make them joyful. OK, right. They they, they stay productive. And so to me, the thing about creating positive associations with cannabis, because I think the number one thing that needs to heal is all of us. We've come from the past. Right. Or we've been told this thing is a drug and that it's bad and that there's something wrong with us. So even when people are talking positively about cannabis, it's like they're just talking positively to get it back to ground zero. Yeah. But but like it, it's like it's only to undo the like the past. But let's look into the future. Right. Mm -hmm. Let, let's let's vision the future. And, and part of that is us being honest about how do we consume cannabis and how does it help? us? How does it help us move into the future? Where does it get in our way? And, and as we have more of these open, honest conversations, we can start to create more positive associations. 
and, it, and, and especially with feeling good, like yeah. feeling good is a good thing. Right? <laughs> I tell people Heisman, it's not about a trophy. It's about getting high. Yeah. Right. Cause you don't win the trophies. If you don't get high, if you can't raise above and envision yourself, you know, if I didn't envision myself breaking the record on a 60 yard run. Okay. I, I would, <laughs> I couldn't, right? I had to be able to envision that. Yeah, and and being able to do that allows you to um, look at the future as a positive thing. And, um, you know, I just I love what you're talking about here, brother. It's really uh, encouraging to me and uh, in partnership with you and, uh, you know, as a fellow uh, Longhorn, as a fellow cannabis and plant enthusiast, uh, everything you've ever stood for. Uh, ultimately culminating in what you're doing today. And, you know, I'm just so proud uh, of being a witness to your journey and a part of this business. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about that at this point in time. Um, you know, talked about uh, how you got here. Uh, I, I think, you know, in terms of the future, as you said, uh, what is that going to look like? And how are you going to drive that forward with Heisman? One of the things I love about Heisman is the name uh, is so great. Uh, but as you said, um, it's about finding what's good for you and having free will and choosing that. Uh, one of the things you say about the mentality of Heisman is the appreciation for greatness. And so what does that mean to you? And ultimately, what does appreciating greatness uh, mean in terms of affecting your mission with this brand? Yeah. So, so you know, I had this conversation with, uh, with Lane, our, our head of marketing, and I said, you know, the goal for me is for people to associate our brand with greatness. Hmm. Right. And, and, and so because, you know, we're emerged. So imagine, you know, putting on putting on clothes. Right. And something about putting on the clothes that's associated with greatness. OK. Hmm. We're also a cannabis flower brand. OK. So man, uh, uh, imagine consuming cannabis and the intention, the energy, the set and setting. OK. Carries this energy of greatness. Right. The, to not to me, if we if we hit that, it's a home run, and it yeah. comes from my own personal experience. Okay, because it's it's easy to tap into greatness when you're on top. Okay, but but you don't make it there. You don't you don't make it there unless you can envision the greatness when you're not on top. Mm -hmm. Right. When I talk to people, they're like, it's easy for you to say that you're a Heisman Trophy winner. I was like, I wasn't born a Heisman Trophy winner. <laughs> and if you saw like where I came from, there was right, I had a very little little shot. I had to be able to to dream and see a bigger vision for myself and then do whatever it takes to to achieve that vision. OK. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember I was like on the precipice of, of fulfilling my dream of being the best college football running back ever. OK. I came back to Texas for my senior year. Main reason I came back, I had an opportunity to not only win the Heisman Trophy, but to become the all time leading rusher in college football history. The all time leading rusher in college football his the most yards ever in college football history the most touchdowns ever in college football history and the most all purpose yards in college football history. Okay. So I had big goals. Okay. I had big goals and I was coming back to a new coach and uh, coming off of a four and 17. All right. Putting all my marbles in one basket. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so come back from my senior year, first game, I tear it up. Second game, I tear it up, but we get our butts kicked. Okay. And still second game, we get our butts kicked. I find out that my girlfriend is now with, the quarterback. <laughs> so it was just, that was just, <laughs> and, then, and then the next week we, we go to Kansas state. They hold me to like 40 yards. I pull, I have this quad strain. Okay. And I'm just like, my life is fine. I'm like, why I should be in the NFL right now drinking crystal, but I'm sitting here and like <laughs> my body hurts. My heart hurts. What did I do? You know, mm -hmm. like that, that's where I was. Okay. And, and I came home one day and my friend was like, <laughs> you need to chill. Right. And he, and he was a smoker and he brought out his bong and he was like here. And I wasn't really a smoker. I would hang out with the guys sometimes, but I wasn't a smoker. And so he was like, here, you need to hit this. And I, you know, I was having a rough night. So I said, whatever. And so I remember I, I hit it. And again, I wasn't much of a smoker. And I remember going up to my room and laying on the bed and just thinking about things. Right. And, and as I looked in, and I started thinking about things, I was able to like start letting them go. You know, and then the idea popped into my head. I need to laugh. Right. So I, I right. got up. I went to Blockbuster. For those of you who know Blockbuster, <laughs> I went to Blockbuster and, I, and I, I always wanted to watch the old movie Blazing Saddles. So I went to Blockbuster. I rented Blazing Saddles, came home on my big, my big screen, my big wide, big screen and my beanbag. 
And I and I watched the movie and I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. And it was like the first night I wasn't obsessing about all the other stuff, you know, and at the end of the night before I went to bed, I started to be able to envision things getting better. OK. All right. Even with my strained, my strained quad and my, my injury, you know, the next two weeks, back to back 300 yard games. OK. And I was wow. and I was back back on track. OK. Yeah. The way the story ends. Yes. I, at, when I left Texas, all time leading rusher. All time leading scorer, all, all time, all purpose. And I won the Heisman Trophy. And so in that moment was special because it, it was the ability to, like, you know, let go. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and kind of connect to the bigger vision that I think really, really saved me and allowed me to be in a position where I could get the most out of my talents and my ability. Well said. And I, I didn't know all that story, although we've known each other a long time. You know, um, one thing that I can say for certain um, with your own greatness and your ability to envision your future is the fact that you've surrounded yourself with greatness. And um, you've done that in your own family. Um, you've done that in uh, your football career. And from what I can tell from working with you for years now, you've done that with Heisman. And um, can you speak at all to what that means to you to, uh, and for other, others that are watching this in terms of um, getting yourself where you need to be through the things you've mentioned and then ultimately preparing for greatness with a team. And how do you get there? Yeah. So this is an interesting question. So, I mean, obviously I won the Heisman trophy and, and, you know, the best player in the country, best player on my team, you know, went to the NFL, led the NFL in rushing. And so this, this feeling of, you know, most of my life being, if not the best, one of the best players on the team. Right. And there's always kind of a hierarchy on a team. Okay. And usually on a, on a team, right, at least when I was playing ball, the way I played, you put the team on one person's shoulder and everyone kind of plays a supporting role, okay? And, and that kind of works, you know? That kind of works. Uh, but that was where I came from. And then as I got into the business world and I realized as people started to come around and support and work for me, it's like they looked at me as the, like the person that, I, you know, because you're the famous one, everything is going to work, Right. And even if they were talented, still that idea, first of all, it didn't feel good because I don't want to be, I don't want to have everything on my back. I want to work as a team. Like, yeah. like I want to be a team, right? I want to be like X-Men, right? Or, or like, like, like I want all of us to be superheroes. I want all of us to be Heisman, Heismans. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so like, once I realized that I started, I started making different choices and I started saying, I need to surround myself with people that make me better. You know, I'm tired of being the best or the smart, but I'm tired of being the most. I'm tired of being that. OK, like let's let's all raise each other's game. Yeah. And, and that's been a learning process. And I feel like at Heisman, we're 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 finding that sweet spot. I mean, we got we got rock stars. And so and, and we, we like each other and we and we care and we feel really good about what we're building. And I think we're you know, I don't mean to call out brands, but even this when people talk about a brand, usually OK, they talk about how we have to build something that is attracted to people that gets them to buy our stuff. Okay. Yep. It, that, that's even how they talk about it. <laughs> they they re- out loud, yeah. out loud. That's how they talk about it. And, and so when people, <laughs> when the media come to me and they ask me questions about our, and they call it a celebrity and they call it a brand, you know, I, I kind of laugh and I say, it's just us being us. We yep. think that we're doing something that's really cool. Right. The, like you said, empowering. This is what we're about. Like, you know, be yourself, like envision whatever situation you're in right now. Right. (laughs) Envision something brighter, like surround yourself with people that can help you achieve it and go do it. To me, like that's what we are. That's what we live. And the idea is, is, you know, when you're interacting with this brand, like that's what you get. Right. You're adding that that quality, that vibration to your life. Right. we, We don't have to create a brand. We like we. This is what we are. Yeah. And, and, and I, I'm a testament to that, friend, being a part of your team and seeing this team you've assembled every, every quarter that goes by, you're adding people that um, are, are, are truly special. And um, as you see more pro athletes uh, enter the cannabis industry, talking about brand and um, what that means, how do you want Heisman to distinguish itself as a brand in this industry? Well, just in what I said is that it's not something that that people that we have to convince people. It's something that is like 
it, that, literally, I, and, and you know, it's my brand. So, but I remember when I got my first like Heisman sweats and I put them on, like <laughs> just what, you know, like I, I you know, I, like I ran three, three laps around the, around the block, you know, I, did, I started doing like, it, <laughs> that, 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 it, it had, it had an effect. And I see, you know, when I do autograph signings or I meet people, you know, I, I make a real sincere effort to be present and to like share who I am with someone. And it, you see, like it, it makes it, I, you do the same thing. It makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the, the brand, yeah, we, you know, in order to be sustainable, we, we have to, we have to generate revenue. But for me, the brand is about using my platform to get this really important message out in the world and make yeah. it cool because it is yeah. right. The story, like my story was, I thought I was bad because of this, but I have realized this is why I'm so great. Yeah. Yeah, you really are, man. And um, you, you, your greatness extends far beyond your athletic ability. Um, and and everybody is going to get to know that more through this brand you're bringing to the world. And so my last question then is, um, you know, an important one. And, and I hope everybody's paying attention to this because this is, I think, why you're doing what you're doing. And that question is, how do you want Heisman and its products to most help others in this world? What impact do you want to create for people with this line of business? So that I think that we all have like these, these kind of limitations, right? In our mind about what's going to stop us or what's going to get in the way from us achieving our goals. Okay. And I want, you know, what Heisman to represent is when you're, when you're interacting with the, with our brand, those limitations start to dissolve and start to melt away. Well said, and I, and I hope um, everybody that's watching this or listening to it or reading it somewhere uh, recognizes an individual who not only is present, but truly uh, embodies what it means to be aligned with body, mind, and soul. Body being, what is it you put out in the world? Mind being, who are you in here? In soul, we all know whatever you believe in, there's some other voice or intuition or gut or spirit or energy that comes into your life that gives you another answer. And, and Rick, um, I can just say from many years of friendship with you, uh, above anyone else I've ever known, you're a person that's truly aligned in those three areas every day of your life. And that authentic nature um, of your being um, is just a huge piece of why this industry is where it is today. And uh, on behalf of Honeysuckle, um, on behalf of Arcadian Capital, um, on behalf of the entire plant wellness space and uh, this special edition for uh, Black History Month and as we get to another Super Bowl, um, we thank you for your service, your work, and uh, I think we all know the best is yet to come. This is a culmination of everything you've put together uh, in this business and, and we're just all excited to see the impact it makes on the world. Well, I was going to say it's a it's a it's a we, and I think I've realized that as as a football player, and I measure my greatness by how much I inspire other people to achieve their greatness. Because we can't, I can't do it. I can't do it by myself, right? We can't do it by ourselves. We need all of all of us need to step up. Yes, we have one more for you. Yes. One okay. More quick you. Um, thank you. It was a very enlightening and fascinating story. Um. So for us, we just wanted to know, um, in your personal opinion, what does Black History Month mean to you? I know, you know, it's one month and all that, but like what significance does it have for you personally? And also in your study of spirituality and evolution, um, how do you think that humans will evolve in terms of race? Is that something that you've observed, um, you know, on a spiritual level? Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting. Interesting question. So. You know, one of the things that I, and I think of race and spirituality is that uh, spirit, spirituality, right, and is a spirit, right? And if you say, like, what color is your spirit, okay, it's, it doesn't have a color, okay? It's only when it comes into a body that has a color. And so when, when I was doing in India, traveling with, with, my, with my yoga teacher, she, she would always tell me whenever she would hear me going into a story about being a man or about being black, she would remind me, you know, in, in Sanskrit, they, the word for soul is Atma. She would say, you are, you are not that. She said, you are the soul. You are the Atma. Right? And she would remind me. OK, and I would I would put that would change my perspective to realize that I am a soul having an experience in the body of an African-American. 
Okay. And, and from there, there's, there's like, for me, there's an expansive understanding and appreciation of, of race relations and this whole idea. And so for me, I see it as bigger than race. I see it as white and black, meaning there's certain things that we're taught are good that we're supposed to accept. And there are certain things that we're taught are bad or we're supposed to neglect. And these are the things that get, that get pushed into the unconscious or that get projected onto minorities. Right. And I think this is the, this is the real issue is that we have to see that there's, that it's all beautiful. You know, my, my, my mom always said, God don't make ugly. It doesn't. So there, there is no darkness, right? There's contrast. If we can appreciate the contrast, we can appreciate the difference. I think that's what we're moving towards. And I think that's in some sense from a spiritual perspective, that's the point of race, right? Is that we have to see our other side. Right. And we can hate it or we can love it. But this is an opportunity to love. Well said. OK. Hey, hey, no, this was great. Yeah, this was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, it's fun to do. It's easy when you know somebody, you know. Right.